Hey guys, welcome to the show. Hey, um, I did a quick little thing just to talk about. Um, I, I'm broadcasting at 1070, I think. So we'll see if the, if, if the video is better or not. I'm trying to increase the quality of what we do around here ever so slightly. <coughs> Excuse me. So welcome to um, podcast from the <laughs> podcast from the front. Uh, guys, it's been a long week. Trust me. It's been a long week at work. It got me I'm, I'm busting my butt. Welcome to Postcards from the Front, episode 11, me, myself, and I. Tonight, we're going to talk about some of my thoughts on solo game design and kind of share those with you. I've got a number of designs that I'm working on that are solo, and I thought this would be a good episode to just kind of talk about some of the different, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> I got something stuck in my throat tonight. Um but I thought this would be a good episode to talk about just some of my thoughts on uh, solo game design. And when I play solo games, what I look for, and when I play multiplayer games, you know, typically most war games are two player games, but there are a lot that are not. And there's always a push to take a game and make it play solo. And I think in some cases that it's easy enough to do. Uh, you can take a game that, is not designed to be solo as multiplayer and play it on both sides. That's one form of solo. What I'm going to kind of more, more focus on is an actual, you know, the design of games that are around one player with, with that in mind. And I do see sometimes where solo games are done in such a way that you can do co-op, uh, which I think is an interesting game what do you want to call it? I'm just going to call it a game mechanic. It's not really a mechanic, but a game experience, I guess, is probably a better way to put it. But before we get too deep into where my mind is, let's go into uh, see who's in chat. <laughs> I know early on, Walk About Games is in the house saying hello all. How's it going? How's the how's Canada? How's the weather? Um, talking with my friend Charles here, we're both sweating. It's a little warm right now as I kind of said to him, <laughs> he said, yep, my sweat is perspiring. Not gonna complain, I prefer warmer weather than colder weather, but um, yeah, it's it's a little warm. I walk about, we were talking in chat prior to the show, and he was saying that he's done a lot of his gaming wise has been solo, and actually a lot of mine has been lately as well. Um, other than the Play testers podcast where I get a chance to play with some other people, which has been kind of cool and, and getting into tabletop simulator, uh, which is, I don't know why I haven't been using that earlier, quite honestly. And then New York uh, writer fan popped in, said, let's go. How's it going, my friend? And then a couple interesting things here from Charles it says first mission INT intercept. I think that's interceptor ace volume two. Got a B 17 and a Mustang. My 109 got damaged, but <laughs> hit the tailplane and died. There's something to be said here. Uh, now, this is a correct me if I'm wrong, Charles. Is this a GMT game? But what you're going to see in a lot of these solo games, not all, but quite a few of them, there's, there's a narrative. And this is a great narrative, right? <laughs> First mission, bails out, and it's hit by the, the plane's tail. And then he also says, First mission of Western Front Ace. And I think that's the new World War I uh, game. Damaged a German two-seater. They got away. I landed safely. Now, to me, that's a victory. You get up, you get a little combat, you get home safely. Oh, okay. That, I had a chance to play test, but then did not get the time to do it. And I was kind of bummed. Hello. Cabs, move it. Thank you, Mike. Mariner Mike says, coming through at 1080, 10, uh, 1080p, what did I say before? 1040 or something? Such what I know. 
Vigilant says, evening all. And congratulations on starting your channel, my friend, and getting your videos up with your games. Like I said, you're kind of getting, oh, okay, she's just going to be insufferable here. Oh, yes, little girl. But I need to, I need my space. It looks like I'm going to lose this one. I'll give her, come on. There. Sorry about that, guys. And me and your mic says, greetings all. Oh, hot for you as well. Okay. Hi, Stuka Joe. How are you, sir? Hey, how late is it for you right now? What's our time difference? And thank you for uh, popping in. I appreciate it. Compass. Okay. Not GMT. Compass. That's right. And that's the same with Western Ace, right? Western Front Ace or whatever it's called. The World War One one. So, oh, okay, 55 or so. Well, that's not that's not a bad temperature, 13. I See, I've got my phone set to Celsius because um, I work with a company. We have staff in India, and I'm trying to learn. I, I don't know if you call that metric, but I'm giving it my best shot. And then thanks for the link on the, um, the U.S. Cricket League. I don't know if you noticed, and this – we won't get too deep into that that conversation, but we were having a conversation offline. And I was talking about I like cricket, um, but all, I think all the games are played in North Carolina, so that's they, you know, use cities for their their team names and stuff. But I think everything's located in North Carolina, so we'll see how that goes. Charles says, "Yeah, <laughs> upstaged by the kitty." Yeah, uh, kitty wants attention. Yeah. Okay, so 9 p.m. Oh, that's not too bad. It's only three hours different. Why did I think you were in Europe somewhere? Or you're in South America, maybe, Stuka? Hi, Mike. How are you, sir? Thanks for popping in. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's metric. Okay. Boring stuff. So... I wrote a few notes, and and I and I have a couple of games, stack of them here, solo games, um, that I can reference and talk about things. Hey, yeah, cricket game design. That's for another conversation because I definitely want to maybe try my hand at some point uh, doing uh, some sports game design. Um, I've got an idea for a NASCAR game, and I've got one for. Uh, Tour de France. I, I like professional cycling as well um, as a spectator, not as a participant. I'm too old for that. Oh, Puerto Rico. Thank you, Stuka. I appreciate it. Okay, guys. So some of the thoughts. Um, and again, I may ramble a little bit as, as I usually do, especially when I'm... It's perfect uh, title tonight, solo, because I'm, I'm, I'm flying solo at the moment. Uh, Chris is not Jay is going to uh, J3, which is a convention. Well, it's, it's it's kind of an invite-only gathering of friends to game that his brother puts on. And they've been doing it, I think he said, tens of years for quite a while. Uh, last weekend, uh, Battles and Brews, I think he went to. And this weekend, um, he's going to his, his brother's a gaming event, which there are going to be a number of people there. It's going to be a lot of fun. So if you're listening at all, Chris, travel safe, and we'll definitely touch base next week. Now, quick note about next week. Uh, like I said, my my day job's been killing me lately. I'm actually, I live in San Diego. The company I work for is located up in Walnut Creek, which is in the East Bay of the Bay Area. Uh, and I will be, and I used to live, I grew up basically in, in the East Bay. But I will be driving up Saturday morning and spending the whole week going into the office. But I'll be at my oldest daughter's place, which is like an hour and a half drive from the office. So I'm going to drive six hours to get an hour and a half closer to work to, to commute three hours a day for a week. It's going to be crazy. But a lot of important stuff. Uh, I kind of have a key role in the company. So I need to be there. And we've got a lot of things that we're, we're, we're planning for the next couple quarters. So that's going to be intense. <clears throat> now, I do plan to, to have a show next week. Uh, and also, even though I'm driving up Saturday morning, I may be coming back either Friday night or Saturday. 
will probably have both the postcards from the front and the play testers. So uh, I plan on keeping my schedule on that. Um, we'll see how that goes though. So Thursday off chance that it might not happen, but um, I'll do my best right now. It's 85% chance I'm going to be there. I did reach out to the Dietz foundation uh, earlier today and um, to get to the next steps to get all these 48 games published. So I started to get the ball rolling on that. I need to get through some stuff at work so I could focus on, on getting this, this done. Um, and I know the Dietz Foundation is pretty busy with the Toro Commander and a few of the things that they've got going on. Um, I'm hopping a little. Okay, spent eight years in East Bay in Dublin at Camp Parks. So um, I grew up in Alameda and then <clears throat> met my first wife. I was going to Chabot College and she lived in Dublin. And I, and I lived in Dublin for. Oh my God, a number of years until we bought a place in San Ramon and then moved to San Ramon, then got divorced, moved to Danville and then decided to move to San Diego about eight or nine years ago. And that's not why you guys are here, but um, Ragnard Rich, thanks for popping in. That's a new name for me. So welcome to the, to the podcast. I appreciate you, you coming in. Uh, work backwards a little bit. Uh, Charles says, who's going to take care of your kitties? I actually take them with me. Uh, if if I'm traveling and I'm away for two or three days, um, they stay at the house by themselves. Uh, if I'm going longer than that, I don't like to leave them for three or four days uh, alone. I'll take them with me. And so my oldest one is 16 and she's at that point where I don't want to go on a trip and come back and she's expired. Um, that'd be kind of rough. So what does Mike say here? I wish your industry would use standard terminology solitaire for games that are designed for one player and solo two player games that can be played by one person. And that's a good point, Mike. Um, so if, if I'm reading this correctly, you're, you're saying that solo would be designed for one player or excuse me, solitaire is a game designed for one and solo two-player games that can be played by one person. What would we call that? Solo? Two-player games that can be played by one person. Okay. I'm. You know what? Why don't we just try to make that happen? At least, you know, I'm going to start using the term solitaire and then solo. We'll see, we'll see how good I do. But I, I agree with you because... I don't know how many times I've seen an unboxing where somebody will say this game isn't solo friendly or it's solo friendly. And I don't know about you guys, but when you look on the back of a box and it's got solo ability and it's got a scale, I'm sometimes maybe I'm a simpleton and I get, I get the ratings, but for me, it's either you can or you can't. Um, and maybe the, the rating is more the difficulty or how much lifting you have to do as a player to play a game solo. So a game with a solo rating of two or three means maybe it's really not designed to be solo, but if you really wanted to be a trooper, you could, you could get through um, with it. That would kind of make sense to me. Meandering Mike's going to pop in here in a minute if this, this camera comes up. Hey, there we go, boss. Welcome to the show. Pop. Um, Stuka Joe says solo a bull. Okay. I was just talking about the ratings that you see on the back of boxes for difficulty and solo ability. Um, and I was just saying, for me, a lot of times it's just kind of and you either can or you can't. I agree with that term, soloable. But yeah, it's kind of a weird mouthful. <laughs> so solo well, friendly is probably a friendlier term. Did you happen to see what Mike had put up? Yeah. Okay. 
Let me turn my volume up here. Definitely a game that's designed from the ground up as solitaire play, one person mm -hmm. can be called, should be called a solitaire game. <laughs> but a game that you can easily solo playing all the player positions shouldn't be called a solitaire game. You could you can rate it high on solitaire suitability, but don't call it a solitaire game. I agree with that. Yeah, and I don't know if I've seen them called solitaire. I think it's the the term "can you play it solo" has been used. But yeah, and then you say, well, solo friendly, you know, if if there's not a solo mode where you literally have a mode where you are playing not against another player position, but against mechanisms in the, the rules that may bot control what could be a player position. But if you are playing against other players where you have to play the players, that can be very solo friendly. If there's no hidden information, and especially if there's enough interesting complex decisions, each time you sit down to look at that other player position, you can surprise yourself. Like, well, I didn't see this <laughs> when I was planning the other side, and now I'm, oh my God, well, I got to scramble, you know, because my other me, as you say, me, myself, and I, yeah, <laughs> is going to kick my ass if I don't do something, you know. So then you can pat yourself on, on the back saying, oh my, that was good strategy, you know, or not. Well, so in the context of game design, from my well, my brain starts to engage in some of these games and, and you bring up hidden information and I think that games that have hidden information can be a challenge to design a solo bot for um, and I'm thinking Bismarck from VUCA as an example, because for some reason I have this desire to go build a solo. I haven't seen that one yet. Um, it's it's um, it's not double blind, but it's kind of blind movement. It's you you've got your board with a screen, they've got a screen and their board, and they move around. And there's mechanics for finding where the the enemy is located and whether you're doing search aircraft and things like that. And so there's, it's very heavy on hidden information, but I looked at that and thought that's a game I could probably make into a solo game, a solitaire. Let me, let me get the terminology correctly, a solitaire game. And, and, and we'll talk about, well, some of the th thoughts that I want to share when it comes to design are, whether we're building or designing a solitaire game, you have a two-player game that maybe has been popular and people are clamoring for um, a solo bot. And then you have games that maybe as you design them, you you build the two-player game and then you, you build the solo ability. And a lot of times it comes off at least, and again, I don't see behind the scenes on all these designs, but I think sometimes they come up, come around as an afterthought or uh, I'm going to make it a multiplayer game and then we'll, we'll do the solitaire or the solo, not solitaire, we'll do the solo version as a secondary thought. And what I see is trying to, you see these diagrams that take the two player mechanic and try to give you some guidelines if you're playing that bot using those two player mechanics. And I think, and I wanna be careful of the words that I use, <laughs> not better, but a different approach would be, and I, and I wanna think about the manufacturing of this game because it's already got all these components, is can we design that game with a different rule set with those same components, meaning it's a completely different gaming experience. You don't have to use the two-player or multiplayer mechanics. 
and build a right. bot that basically plays it as you're playing multiple players. That, that is definitely an option, which potentially could be a lot more development work and design work. Oh, I think it would be. But but in some instances, it's worth it. And some people like, I'm never going to play that part. Or some people only want the solo part. You know, there have been games out like that SPI has done where they throw in a solitaire scenario. I think of Sorcerer way back from 79 or 77, whatever it was, where they had this one scenario that was solitaire where basically the the enemies were coming down straight down the hex rows towards these human cities. And you were trying to you know, hop between the different rows and try to defeat them in one. And, and then maybe you could, so it was kind of like a, a tower defense game almost, right? You know, that's, what, that's exactly what popped in my head was tower defense. And it was interesting, but you know, it, it didn't make that a solo from the game. Cause that was just one scenario out of many and, it was an okay scenario, but it inspired thoughts in my mind where later I was trying to uh, create a solo game that looking back on it seemed kind of like a, a precursor to States of Siege, not States of Siege, you know, has the five paths coming into a central area, right? And they, uh -huh. they progress at certain ways. Well, mine was a combination of these sort of paths where the enemy was coming down, but there's these branching paths where they could, change focus instead of all going after the, this, the dwarves they could maybe go off to the elves and you'd have you know these different fantasy kingdoms and have to do you'd have the, the flexibility to be able to move anywhere on the hex encounter map where right. they had pathways with with branching spots where you'd roll a die to see which way they go and things like that so it was kind of states of cg kind of a cross between that sorcerer scenario you know so I was working on, I mean, of course, I never got very far other than a, a few, you know, I made a prototype map and, you know, did a few plays. I was actually using um, the War and Peace Avalon Hill games by Mark McLaughlin, using those counters of the Napoleonic <laughs> warriors as strength points. You know, the, the, the green Russians were elves, of course, and the reds were the dwarves and the blue were the humans and blah, blah, you know. <laughs> but so I do weird things when I design in terms of. Oh, no, I. I, I think we all do that, right? I mean, I mean, yeah, you're trying to play test and um, yeah, I've come up with some interesting things when I was working on my um, um, Rosie game, trying to build. I mean, sometimes I overbuild my prototypes because I like the crafting aspect of it. But so that's kind of an interesting idea of. Um, a tower defense. Now I play those on mobile. Okay. And I, I have a love hate relationship with tower defense, but I can see how some of those mechanics could be put into a, a board game. Um, it's kind of, I'm, I'm sorry, you got my brain kind of engaging. So let me read what, what Mike says here. He says wolf pack has its own category, solitaire, team game because it plays one to four, but it's not a true co-op. You play it more as a team game when more than one person is playing. I think that's his new game that he's working on. Correct me if I'm wrong, Mike. Um, where you're, so now in, in this game, do you play as a single sub or do you play where you control maybe a small wolf pack of three subs. And uh, say if Mike and I were playing, he would have his own three subs that he would be playing. I'd be curious. And I'm sorry, I haven't seen some of your playthroughs on it, so I'm not sure. Yeah, I saw some of his playthrough with like uh, Tony, Tony's board life and yeah. I who else was playing that. That was months ago. Yeah, I know it's, uh, it's supposed to be out relatively soon i don't know we'll see so and, and feel free mike to uh to chat it up and and you know says there in the comments one, one to four u-boats okay so one to four u-boats as in if four so i would command one u-boat and mike would have his own u-boat and we could work together as a team or not okay Vigilant says, board war games are like computer games that run on human brains for hardware. Fair point. 
Um, and that's why I say, you know, I, I, I write software for a living. So when I do game design, it's very similar muscles uh, logically get exercised. When the enemy is being run on the brain of the player, it's very hard to hide things without getting messy. Yeah, <clears throat> very true. Charles says, Worthington's Bismarck Solitaire book game is great. Yeah, so I've actually played that. I put it on the channel. That's actually not a bad game. Uh, in fact, I think Worthington has done a really good job, both of quality and game playability in their solo book games. And like I said, I've got Guadalcanal, I've got uh, Coral Sea, I've got Bismarck, and I've got one other, can't remember the name off the top of my head, but they've done a very good job of, and I don't have all their games, but they've done a very good job, in my opinion. Again, the production quality, I think the value for what you get and the playability of the games is, is really nice. In fact, I had to go get a windshield repaired, and I took Guadalcanal with me, and I sat in the uh, waiting room with one six-sided dice. <laughs> and I'm rolling dice and mumbling to myself, and people were watching, or, you know, were not watching, but were aware that I was doing something abnormal, <laughs> waiting for my windshield to get repaired, um, which is a beauty of those um, – Solo books, by the way, is the fact that they are portable. And that's going to be another, that's going to be a whole topic on its own one night we can talk about because I'm, I'm really digging a lot of what's going on with some of these book games. Um, and most of them are solo. So it fits right into the topic for tonight. So Vigilant says he, that's what he did with a Splinter Card, multiplayer game solo, compete throughout. And that's because I figured most of the people would play solo. And I was right. I got almost zero two player feedback. That makes sense. I mean, it makes sense in that um, most people are probably going to download it and go, hey, I can play this by myself and don't have to worry about contacting one of their buddies to go play it. So Grognard Rich says, hidden movement is a solo killer. So too is deliberate planning process. So it is a, a it, it can be a a solo killer, solitaire killer. And, and what I'm going to do with Bismarck from VUCA is I'm actually going to, and, and again, to Mike's point, this is going to take a lot of design, but my brain wants to, to solve this, right? Because it's like a, it's a tough challenge. And not to get too deep in the design, but I'll share some of my thoughts. Um, is I'm actually going to plot out multiple, like a path. I'm going to sit down and say, in this particular version of the game, this is where the Bismarck's going to go. It's going to move here. It's going to move here. It's going to move here, blah, blah, blah. And then based on certain events in the game, here's how it will react. So it's going to be scripted. You just as a player won't know what that script is. Once I get one path working, I can then build two, three, four, five, six scripts, whatever makes sense. And yeah, it may be overkill, maybe a lot of work. But then when you play, you're going to be playing against one of those six possible scripts, not knowing. And then I got to figure out how I can keep it simple. And so you don't know, hey, there's six. When you first start playing it, you won't know what they are. And if you get six playthroughs and you happen to play all six of them, hey, that might be a win because how many of us actually sit down and play many of our games more than six times? Uh, now, I know there are exceptions. So, Mike, on that uh, aspect there, so if you have a game that there's good checkpoints at, there's certain stages or phases to the game, you can have a bunch of options like leading up to this one, and then you have a separate set of like scripts or options from that point that go out from there, and so the permutations increase instead of just saying I've got six. It's like there could be six for the first phase and then six for the next. And so you could have this phase and then that phase. And then you could have some interdependence between them, like a finite state machine. Like if, you know, these four can only go to these four and these, you know, they, they overlap a little bit. So like 
at any given time, it's not any of these six can lead to any of these six to any of these six. You have some overlapping possibilities, and that would give you a lot of replayability. It would cause a lot more need for playtesting. <laughs> <We're certainly, laughs> like, oh my God, this one is just horrible. Like you can't win or you'll always win if you figure out the trick or something. But that can give you a ton of playability is having, you know, chained sets of, of scripts that, you know, it's like in some of those command and conquer video game where sometimes like you do this scenario and win it, you can skip this one or something like that. Yeah. So, so what I did is I put a link in the description of the video um, to twine.org. And that is a tool to do kind of choose your own adventure um, design, whether it's a story or a game. And it allows you to manage all of those permutations you're talking about, Mike. <clears throat> and so you can start, say, script one. For lack of a better term, I'll call them a script, right? And the Bismarck is going to go north and it's going to move along at a certain rate. And then to your point, maybe after three turns, that branches into script 1A and 1B, 1C. And you build the, so you, that one script may end up with, and I'm just going to make up a number, um, 16 endpoints. That might be way too much to design. I may be biting off more than I can have time to do, or, or you know, you can lose a lot of enthusiasm. It sounds great now. And then you build that second script, and let's say, it, let's make it a little more realistic, maybe eight endpoints, right? So then the second script, and then there's some interlocking where maybe you go from one to another one. I, I want to, I, I, what I want to try to avoid is if you play the game a second time, and you happen to have the same script, depending on when, when you discover what's going on and whether you know you're on the same script or not, um, you're going to have a metagame that you're going to have information from a previous playthrough that will, as much as we try not to use it, we're going to say, last time I played this, the Bismarck went through that straight. And so you're going you're gonna to anticipate that it's going to do something very similar. Right. And if you have... You know, if the player is discovering, aha, the ship is at this point at this time, and because the last time he did this, I'm assuming that, well, there could be these different scripts where this time he's starting here going this way, and, and they cross paths in your different possibilities. So if they encounter him here, they don't know, well, is he heading this way or is he heading this way? And so enough of those kind of checkpoints that have differences after them that they can't just make an automatic assumption that, ah, I saw it last time, therefore it's going to be the same outcome. It's like, well, there's a, a fuzzy set of outcomes that are possible based on right. the, the the proximate events up to that point. So. Yeah, and, and I think at the end of the day, as a designer, what I would want to accomplish is to maintain as much fog of war as possible especially in a game like the Bismarck, where a lot of it is the hunt, right? It's, it's to find it. And once you find it, then you can go into some, some pretty traditional type of combat resolution. I'm going to send a, you know, some um, swordfish to, to, to try to torp it or, or whatever you might be doing in that particular case. And you can tie it all into the history of that particular, um, what are we going to call it an event? You know, the, the, yeah, I guess you can, we'll call it an event, a historic event. Um, and so Stuka says, the side that moves less appears easier to be controlled by the AI. So if you make a creep game, the allies are the AI side. Conflicts where both sides move and attack are tougher. Yeah, that's, I, I think that's very true, Stuka. And I think it's because as a designer, Easier in the in the sense of less AI you need to program and less complexity of that. Um, because if you don't have as many options, you're not moving a lot, it's going to be a lot less complex and therefore make it easier. It doesn't mean it's necessarily easy. And I don't think you're saying it's easy if it's one side doesn't move a lot. Uh, and when both sides are moving and attacking, then how do you deal with the fog of war aspect. Um, 
because I think there are enough examples of games, again, when it comes to combat resolution on how you can do that in a solitaire game or even a multiplayer game you're playing solo. The attacker is the attacker, the defender is the defender. If you're using a combat resolution table, you're going to do your modifiers, you're going to roll dice. It's when you get into variables that may come into play, uh, such as maybe leadership ability or, or whatever the game is. I'm not going to make up a bunch of what ifs because all games have their own set of variables or what I like to call sometimes in game design is I call them levers. Levers are something in a game that I'm working on that I can tweak. I can add more or less, right? So I'm like the mad scientist sitting there in a room controlling steam machines or whatever to make my games. <laughs> At least that's the vision that I have in my in my head. Have you seen uh, Fritz Lang's Metropolis? No, I have not. Yeah, try, try to find a, a copy of that. And it's, yeah, there's, 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 People being very machine-like, it's it's a great visionary movie from like 27, 1927. So later I'll get the name of that from you. I'll go check that out. Because that's, that's what I envision in my head sometimes when I'm doing game design is I'm just like a mad scientist trying to make things work. Whether they're war games or board games, because I do both. Um, although I prefer war games. That's just kind of my jam. Mike says, if uh, I'm playing myself, I command one to four of us are playing. We each have one. Okay, so if you're playing solitaire, so all four of the, the, the boats could be used depending on what you feel like doing or commanding or the scenario you're playing. And then you could then have up to four people. Now, it's a team thing. So... When you were saying earlier it's not really co-op, I'm not seeing how it's not. And maybe that's a discussion for another time. Um, I'm going to have to watch some of your videos because I like the concept. Who doesn't like submarines, by the way? I mean, I love submarines and submarine battles. Grognar Rich says, that's funny. People don't understand our obsession. I didn't get the reference to what you were talking about there, Rich, but... I don't think people understand our obsession to some of the things that we do. <laughs> I think that's, that's kind of universal. Okay, Chase the Bismarck at Tempe. Is that what it's called, Chase the Bismarck from uh, VUCA? I've got it. It's a, Oh, my God, it's a beautiful game. It's a beautiful game. Uh, Rich says, great ideas. And Charles says, I've thought about trying to design a game a few times but it hurt my brain. Now with miniatures, I'd rather build and plan my own scenarios to avoid the rule sets. So that's actually a good point, Charles. If you're somebody that wants to design a game, and some of you designers that are in, you know, Mike and, and, and anybody that maybe I'm not recognizing that's in chat that does some, I know Walkabout Games was here earlier and he's got a, a game that I really wanna check out, a tactical game. Uh, but as a game designer, I think designing scenarios for existing game sets is the perfect entry into game design because you don't have to build this, the structure of the house, right? You're really just going in and putting some paint on the walls and hanging some pictures, basically. You don't have to worry about the foundation. The game is there. Now, your scenarios might not be balanced, but that's part of learning game design. And you've already got all the components you need. You've got all the rules. It's just a matter of looking at some of the scenarios and tweaking them. Take an existing scenario and um, make it longer, make it shorter, bring in more forces. And, and I think that's a great way to start designing a game because it's really easy. And I do this all the time. And I've got stacks of dead ideas. Well, they're not dead ideas because they're still ideas but they don't get worked on because I've got other ideas that I like more today, <laughs> tomorrow. They're marinating. They're, they're marinating. I like that. They're marinating. Um, but I've got ideas all over the place and some of them are pretty ambitious. Um, I have the, you know, like I was talking about with this, the VUCA Bismarck game, that would be pretty ambitious just to write one script, I think. Um, and have it branch out with 
8, 12, 24, 36, whatever endpoints, um, just one. And to Mike's point, how do you play test that properly? Because once people know how it works, it becomes a little harder to play test to get that real sense of um, fog of war. But Charles, I highly, because I do it, so we want everybody else to do it, right? Do what I do. It's kind of human nature. Give it a shot. Take your uh, Western Aces and see if you can come up with a simple scenario. A couple, three, four aircraft. I'm sure you can do it. The auto waiting room. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes, sir. Um, nobody came up and asked me anything, but I, a couple of times I dropped the dice and tink, 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 and it rolls across the floor and I go pick it up and people are like, what's this guy doing over here rolling dice, reading a book? and marking things down with a pencil. So, yeah, it was kind of funny. Mike says, a cooperative game, each player has unique abilities and they can combine these to achieve an objective. We'll pack teams, each player combines their score to achieve victory. Okay. So it sounds like Wolfpack, you're just out there independently shooting down merchant ships and, you know, maybe, you know, I got more uh, but you know, in the end, you still have to add your score together to to win. But I don't know enough of the mindset of the German submariners. I now this is just through listening to books on tape and a little bit of historical reference uh, in the Pacific. I know that many of the the, the U.S. Navy submarines. At least one of the reasons that was given why they didn't work well in wolf packs is because many of them were lone wolves, right? They were going out there doing their thing. They had their different approaches on how they were going to go into combat, uh, different amounts of risk that they would take. And I, does your game deal with uh, risk at all? I guess that's, that's going to be on the player. Okay, I just answered my own question. Um, it'd be interesting to see in the, if you're playing at solitaire, if any of those captains of the four boats, because if you're commanding them, they're all going to have the exact same risk aversion. It'd be interesting to have that as a trait to say, I'm going to do something for this turn, but I have to roll against my risk aversion. I may, that for whatever reason, I might fail that roll kind of, parallel to a, say, a morale check, although you're not necessarily losing your morale. It's just, is that a risk you're willing to take with your with your resources, your, your equipment, your men? And you have to then pass some kind of check. That would be interesting, especially when you as a player are controlling four boats. Chris uses the term friction. He didn't coin it, but he uses it a lot. So I'm going to give him credit for it, at least in our conversations. And that creates friction um, in a solitaire game that you and that's I think in something along those lines that also gives you a little bit of fog of war. OK, here's my plan. I've got these four boats. I'm going to do something. Um, but maybe that captain in U-52 decides that uh, they don't go in as hot and heavy or they're a little more conservative and they don't fire a spread of four torps. They only fire two or something along those lines. That would be pretty interesting. Tons of risks. You never know if the convoy will have escorts or how long, how many crews. Oh, okay. And good. Each escort crews are handing you boats. Cool. I'm looking forward to seeing it, Mike. It's going to be definitely something that I'm going to, pick up when, when it when's it going to be released if you don't mind me asking do you have a date i'm sorry for my ignorance if you've already said it on the other channels just try as i might i don't watch everything so let me go back to the the, the thought that i had earlier about designing uh, a game specifically as a solitaire game for me 
when I play a game that's designed specifically for solitaire, I've had the most enjoyable solitaire experiences. Not that um, I haven't played multiplayer games by myself and had a good time and enjoyed it. And, uh, but when it comes to games that are strictly solitaire and I'm playing it solitaire, I get the, the best game experience in my opinion. I know, is that something you experienced as well, Mike, or am I kind of unique in that? Can you repeat that? I was, uh, my brain was off on a little tangent. <laughs> no problem. I was just saying that when I play a game that's purposely designed for solitaire play, that I get a much better experience than when I take a multiplayer game and play it solo. Not that I haven't had good times doing that and I enjoy doing it both ways, it just seems to me that a game that's designed specifically for solo just gives me a better experience. And, I, and again, there are going to be exceptions to this rule. I'm not saying that I don't like certain games and I play them, but for the most part, like Terawatt here. I really enjoy this game. And it's designed specifically to be played solitaire. So for me, I have a long experience with taking a multiplayer game and just playing it solo not not trying to change the game but just playing multiple personalities basically and sure. sometimes i will explicitly do that and i'll write down you know this guy's going to use this strategy in general and this guy's going to use that strategy and try to map it out and then just see what happens all together and sometimes i'm just you know making it up as a go playing those different positions but you know as i as i switch to the chair often i will actually like move around the board and look at a different <laughs> side get a new perspective and again i surprise myself sometimes like oh, i didn't see that um there's other times i had this great fear when i was younger that i didn't like to be bored i didn't want to be caught being bored so that's mm -hmm. why i became such an addictive collector of things and games and comics and movies and all this stuff because I never wanted to be like, I don't have anything to do. And so game programming came to me as a way to think, I want to be able to surprise myself in games. I want to be able to learn how to write an opponent that can do things that will catch me by surprise. Now, to some extent, I learned like it's just really just going to be randomness. Like, oh, my God, I had no idea what he's going to do. And sometimes it doesn't make sense because you can't really figure out like, I'm going to outsmart them. I'm going to try to figure out what he's going to do. And it's like, well, it's just random, right? And so there's that balance between how to get a game smart and learning to program real game AI is a huge challenge. And since I didn't really have the right like math background, you really, you really want like a master's level of advanced computer science and, and mathiness. Um, so I never dug into that whole hog, but did come up with a couple of ideas back when I was um, an assistant sysop on the CompuServe game dev forum. We were talking about the AI in, th in games like Empire, Empire Deluxe, uh -huh. um, that, that one space game, Ascendancy, certain, certain games were really bad at the AI, but we were coming up with the idea and Command and Conquer was big then and, you know, uh, Warcraft and Starcraft is like coming with the idea of a playbook where you can have different levels of artificial intelligence that just don't cheat. Like they don't, instead of just having more resources or, or, uh -huh. or producing faster, it's like you design playbooks of, they will try certain tactics that you were talking about scripting. So you have, yeah. you have it broken down at this granular level of try these kind of things, assault in this way, do this form this kind of battle group, throw it here, or well, form this battle group here, but faint over here first and then do this, et cetera. And it's like, have the different levels of AI have more and more plays in their book as they go up. And one of the things that we had was sort of adaptive AI in that have it learn where you have a certain number of plays that a level of AI doesn't know yet but he can learn based on what you do so you're looking for triggers in the game if you pull a certain thing on the dude suddenly 
acting. He's just learned that. And the next time you play him, he's a little smarter and a little smarter. So within reason, your easy AI can get better. <laughs> and the medium one, and the hard one. And that, of course, is one of the things that would take a lot of time and a lot of play testing, trying to figure out you know, how to define and build these different playbooks and how to distribute them and what you could learn and not and stuff like that. But that all stemmed from me not wanting to be bored and how to entertain myself. Yeah. And and why I thought, you know, I want to get into programming, which I did, but, you know, I do data, databases and, and, you know, e-commerce systems and things like that. And it's now that I'm retired, it's like, well, I'm getting back into game design love that I had in the 70s and 80s, but actually, you know, Eventually, I might get back to the programming aspect, but right now it's all in the board board game aspect. So when you were talking about these playbooks, and I wrote that down, I, I'm, I think I'm going to steal that term, uh, playbook, as opposed to scripts. I, I, I like that. It, it's, it ties into gameplay a little, little clearer, I think. Were you talking about computer games or were you talking about board games? At the time, it was, it was computer games. So... The guys that did uh, Mark Baldwin, I'm trying to remember the uh, Rob Rakowski or something. I can't remember. And I, I was a an alpha tester on Empire Two, where okay. they tried to have a more generic um, tech tree kind of system, different ages, and where you could build your own scenarios. And the AI was horrible. It just like it couldn't handle rock paper scissors. Basically, it didn't know how to do it. And they were work. They were talking about. In, in a lot of their articles and papers that they were they were doing white papers about what they were calling project AI, where they were they were coming up with a way to try to do their game AI based on projects that that entities in a game will have a project okay. that they're going to try to solve. And I sort of generalized that as I was doing my own sort of AI research in the background, and again at a very non-mathy level trying to figure this stuff out. And I called it goal-oriented AI, where you, you have a goal and there's different ways to solve it. And you basically have uh, like a bill of materials in manufacturing. You can have <laughs> little goals, like a bigger goal and a bigger goal. And, and so if you learn how to do this thing here, you can use that in these other bigger goals, et cetera. So that was sort of where I wanted to go with it. And that's where the idea of playbooks were a way to say, it's like, it's kind of like, how do you handle a particular goal? You have, so in, in sports, you know, you've got your playbook. You're going to yeah. call a play. You know, you, you maybe your quarterback audibles or not. You don't know, but that flexibility and maybe you you watch game films, right? And oh, well, they tend to do this, you know. So ah, when the 49ers do that, we're going to do this instead. So that idea was a way to one how to organize. You're trying to figure out how to script or determine goals and how they link and what skills and abilities you give the units to set, how do you solve them? How do you try to reach those goals? So that was, you know, a high conceptual level, but the actual programming chops never got close to it. Yeah, no, that, again, I write software. So I, I know those types of challenges when you're building a game loop, how do you go through and check various things, right? Because it's a loop. And, and that's why board game design is very similar to programming in that sense. I was researching, looking at um, knowledge base engines. You know, <laughs> uh, so this was at the time when, like, I was doing programming in Visual Basic, like VB4, and there was like this. Uh, I can't remember what it was called, like MB4 something knowledge base engine, and mm -hmm. uh, trying to trying to learn how to do neural nets and stuff. So. Like when you when you were talking about pushing the levers, I was thinking my mind, well, it's it's inputs and outputs for a neural net. You know, it's kind of like where yeah. my brain was going, right? And how do you train this? How do you you teach it? And again, the actual math, you know, it's like someone said, well, you should learn simulated annealing, and I'm like, what the <laughs> fuck did you just say? Excuse my friend. But yeah, no, that's my that's my response totally, right now. This is totally the kind of thing you want to learn. This is what you can leverage for. Okay, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I got a book somewhere on simulated annealing, but I don't understand the math. You know, it's like some. But, it, but I think you bring up a pretty valid point in that computer games, not all. Obviously, you've got MMOs, and or you know, you're 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 playing with multiple people, PvP. But the PVE environment, in a lot of these games, it really is um, solitaire. I mean, I play, I've been playing Diablo 
don't know if you watched me die last Saturday playing hard. Uh, I heard about you're losing your level 10 character or something. On, uh, well, luckily it was only two hours in, and I'll tell you, I ran that dungeon with a level 16 and got my butt handed to me as well. So but I like to play hardcore mode. That's just something I like to do because there's something about the risk reward. Adrenaline. And I thought about, and again, I'm going to go on a little bit of a tangent here, but I, as a design, I've thought about how you can build in some risk reward type of thing into a board game. And the closest thing I can come up with is the risk where it, you play a game where if you lose the units, you actually have to shred the counters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Don't go there. <laughs> Magic the Gathering started with that kind of stuff. I'm that's kind of what the, the proxy cards and steal people. You know, yeah, and you had to tear them up. Chaos um, but, <laughs> but I don't know how you'd reward somebody if they, they took a risk like that. And you don't want to make uh, a CCG hex encounter game, right? Where you get little booster packs of counters and you open yeah, it up oh, i got sheets. the panzer i got Map the overlays and counter sheets and yeah hey maybe maybe i'll explore has anybody tried dice. that well i mean there's dice games like that and stuff you know yeah but i mean could, imagine if you could open up a booster pack and you go i got the tiger and it's a holofoil tiger counter <sighs> don't go there man now, me personally, I would, I would, I would go for the thing like, here I made, you know, a hundred copies of this game I'm publishing, and six of them have canvas maps instead of paper maps or something like that. But you might at random get the deluxe ultra chase canvas map instead of a paper map or something like that. You know? uh, Fifty yeah. ways to piss off your customers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that again. That's a topic for another another night, but. So let's do this a little bit back to the kind of the, the, the solo design. I, I think there's some value in maybe getting some computer game books that talk about designing AI in computer games. There may be some crossover there. And other people better than me may have already done this. And I may be, you know, not saying anything that's additive to the community. But um, I think I'm going to do a little research in that area because... Again, it, it's a, what's the goal? I mean, you, you say goal oriented. And so when you're playing, like you talked about a multiplayer game and you're just playing the different um, characters in the game or the different factions, then, and, and let me, I was gonna ask you when you were talking about that, do you ever, when you're playing one side, hope that side loses? but you can't play it to lose because you feel like you're cheating. So you I, play it to win, but you want the other side to win for whatever reason. I usually root for the underdog. So whoever's losing, I'm usually like, I want them to win. So so in that way, it's like, I never feel like I'm cheating. I'm not going to cheat, but right. I, I want the guy that's behind to win, right? As opposed to like, oh, he's ahead. And I want him to be ahead. I want him to kick total ass. And you know, like, yeah, but if I'm always scrambling for the little guy then it's it's self-balancing in a way you know you try yeah. harder for the guy that's losing so in, Real, in general i try to play as fair as possible i'm like you i do that too so and that can change so the one one turn um the u.s is maybe losing and i'm hoping that they can win and the next turn it's the japanese and now they've had a turn of bad luck and now i'm i'm rooting for the japanese and when i play them so i i kind of go back and forth in game on that I wanted to make a comment about you were talking about the, the value, like looking at some of these programming techniques or whatever to, to help inform the board gaming. Um, one of the things like you were talking before about having like your scripts and, you know, if you have an, a combinatorial explosion of script, how hard it is to play test that and doing some statistical analysis or, you know, programming to like, I'm looking at this one script here, and if you can sort of quantify the options of that the player would probably do to counter that, right? You know, you're not actually scripting the actual player, but you're trying to say, here are the kind of things that they could do, and you could try to do a statistical analysis to say, you know, they're simulating what would normally be the player playing to see, 
you know, or, or at least keeping track over a certain number of games or, or you know, tr doing random trials to say, let's just assume they have this percent so far. Mm -hmm. If we tweak this, you know, they've had this percent success so far in actual play tests. If we tweak this, if we run these same numbers, what happened to that? Oh, that we totally broke that. You, know, you could maybe do some, save yourself some time play testing using some kind of uh, data analysis, you know, methods or something like that. Yeah. And again, I, like you, uh, I'm my day job, when I say design software, full stack, right? So I build databases and I do data analysis. Um, I'm just thinking how that might work in a play test scenario. I, I think if you can get, and I'm going to talk at a high level, I think if you can get a basic structure, let's just say it, you go from, we'll take one playbook and that playbook is the Bismarck goes north. And logically it's going to go north. It's not going to turn around and come back, right? There's certain things it's not going to do. So you can, you can kind of trim your tree, your decision tree with the, with those poor choices. Except for some catastrophic events like, oh, gee, you know, the, the boiler blew up and, you know, you well, back to home. But in, Valid point, but let me point counterpoint. Um, if I'm playing against that, I don't want a game where the Bismarck leaves port and goes back. Right. <laughs> Where's the game? <laughs> right. Right. So your point is valid. That might be something you could build into a game. Um, but if I'm taking the time, I get everything laid out and I dig into it in three turns, uh, scout plane goes, oh, yeah, the Bismarck turned around and it's going back to port with a uh, lisping you're like <laughs> okay <laughs> that was an experience but um that's not what i wanted to play <laughs> so. there, there could be an interesting uh gameplay aspect that that too of though you know if, if a person's trying to anticipate i think i know these general playbooks i'm gonna aggressively move to these areas here to try and intercept and i'm not going to search for him as much near where he's left thinking yeah. i'm going to catch him out here somewhere and there could be that case where, like, well, he's not zipping off this way. For some reason, he's dinking around here, or maybe he is going to go home. And if you had actually tried to do some searching near where you think he's come out of port, you might actually spot him where he's been, you know, crippled, and you could have caught him and killed him before he limped back to well, port okay, if you hadn't have over anticipated. Okay, see, now that is viable because that's a, that's that's me playing the game and having a what I would consider a positive result or a positive experience. It came out, I was able to discover this and there's a great weakness and I can pounce on it and, and claim victory. I was more talking about the, oh, it came out and it, it's back to port and game over right. and nothing yeah. happened. <laughs> right. Now, I will put one caveat on that. If I'm playing a campaign, that's still a result that might be favorable. And so I do sit down, I play that, and that's the result that moves on to the next game. I think it does carry value, even though it wasn't the greatest play session. It's it's just one of many or multiple one of multiples in an ongoing campaign. I think that that becomes a viable, although unwanted outcome. Unwanted in the game sense. Maybe right. in the campaign sense, it actually it came on. Real quick, I just wanted to respond to Mike on this. I would love to do that, my friend. I'll, I'll reach out to you, and we can schedule to do something. You know, we do have the, the Play Testers podcast where we go on Tabletop Simulator, and we can maybe get a couple of people and play um, your game on Tabletop Simulator or on – I suspect you might also have it on um, Vassal. Vassal, thank you. I think I've seen you have it on Vassal. So I'll reach out to you and we can make that happen um, before the end of the year, before it comes out. I would love to do that. And thank you for the offer. So scripts, designing, or playbooks, I'm going to call it playbooks. And I like the idea of having goals for the AI. Cool. 
Cool beans, my friend. Like I said, I'll reach out to you. And I'm, I'd love to get a chance to, to play it as well. Um, sorry, my I got to remember I need to be talking and not thinking sometimes. <laughs> but which also gets me into trouble when I'm just a talking. Pause. And a little pause is good now and then. Yeah, I know. I know. Um, <clears throat> so where my mind is right now is I'm thinking about I'm sitting down designing a game, um, and the reason I put twine, and this is where I was going with this, the reason I put twine, okay, my cat just knocked over a bunch of aluminum cans because it's a cat. <laughs> but um, the reason I put twine in is one of the games that I've, that I've been really, and it's been on hold for six months, is the Coast Watchers game. And when, like you, Mike, I started playing games and designing games when I was 10 or 11 or 12. Um, sports games mostly um, because that's what I was into until I got my first set of miniatures and they were the little plastic Airfix Napoleonics, which when you painted, the paint would just peel off and crack because they were just, you know, the little small HO scale, whatever uh, miniatures. Uh, and that's when I started getting into playing board games or war games. What was I, about 14? Is that how old you are when you're a freshman in high school? Yeah, I graduated at 17, 14, uh, and, and got exposed big time to a wargaming club at high school. And uh, I think that's I put on my channel the Six Fleet game that I have um, because of, of that experience. But one of the other things that had a huge influence on me is Tunnels and Trolls. And this, I started playing, this is my original book, I think. I've got a stack. <clears throat> Most of these are solo modules. Um, yep. And I, not to get into the design of of tunnels and trolls, but I'm just talking about it from a, uh, an influence. The actual choose your own adventure that that was my introduction into it, and a lot of it is very rudimentary. It's like go to page, you know, go to chapter three or paragraph three C, and you go to three C, and it says there's an orc and he doesn't like you. Fight. <laughs> it's not super descriptive. Right. And, and I'm not knocking them. That was, you know, this was innovative at the time, at least for me. I was like, oh, my God, this is so cool. I can go here and I can play a game and. And you might hear her yelling. She wants to go out, but it's not going to happen. And so. One of those big games that I wanted to design is I wanted to create. The largest choose your own adventure that's ever been built. And. Around that, I'm building a, a series of a, a fantasy game. Oh my God. I don't know. Can you hear her? Yeah, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> no, she's at the front door and she's going to be there for a bit. So, guys, I apologize for that. Um, but then I started doing some research and getting into this, learn the story of the Coast Watchers. And where I'm going with this is what I want to be able to do is to take the choose your own adventure, put some real game mechanics into it. Not that that's not real game mechanics, but they're fairly rudimentary. And, and I'm actually wanting to then expand this into multiple paths on where you can go with a book. And you were talking about playtesting. And one of my concerns on the design side of something like this with a choose your own solitaire war game um, is once somebody plays something and they know kind of the outcome, do they become less valuable as a play tester at that point? I mean, if somebody doesn't know the first time they play something, does that yes them for future no. play testing? It's yes and no. So there's Definitely a need to have I'm a, a virgin play tester, right? A cherry play tester, especially if you change any rules where you've rewritten the rules, 
you need to have. I'm going to shut the front door to shut her up. Keep going. I'm listening. You need to have virgin cherry play testers who learn the game from scratch with the new version of the rules, <laughs> learn it on their own, and play it on their own. And you need to you need to watch that. So so those you're always in, in need for fresh play testers. Yeah, now, there are play testers who may experience your game, but they are good at rooting out the problems, looking at things that will break your game. And they are fine if they've played it before because they're going to see a weakness or a problem or an exploit in your game, and hopefully they've reported it to you, right? They're not just right. there to, to aggrandize them. So, oh, look at the high score I got because I you know, exploited. But you know, <laughs> they're, they're there to find them, and they let you know. And then they're going to go look for it again. And they're going to say, oh, you fixed that. Or, and, and they're looking for something else. Did you break something while you fixed that? So having play testers that are really good at looking at edge cases and trying to push things and trying to use off-the-wall strategies. And I'm going to give a shout-out to my friend, Gerald Johnson. He is like a master at that. Um, nice. You, If you get a play tester like that, you, know, you use them as much as you can, as much as they're willing to donate their time to you. Right. They're, they're, they're invaluable. But... You need a huge, not a huge, you need enough fresh play testers, though. So every time you really change something, you really need some fresh, fresh, fresh blood. Yeah. Now, you, you used a term there that uh, I think is key. And I do the same thing when I play test, and that's edge case. And again, I'm going to harp on to it, goes back to my professional life. You, exactly. that the edge case is what kills you. Right. Because most people, logically, you give them a, a scenario and you say you go to A, B and C and then you're going to get to D. And everybody goes, hey, yeah, I can do that. Um, and then you start throwing in edge cases like numbers that round um, that you didn't know were rounding or the, the, which direction they're rounding or or whatever the case may be um, with a, an array. That's is it zero based or one based? <laughs> You find your your edge cases. Overflowing your buffer. What? Oops! I let this number go negative somehow. Now, what kind of havoc is that going to wreak? Yeah. So, how did that even happen? But I think that I said I love the fact that you you understand what I'm saying because I do the same thing when I play test somebody's game, um, almost to the point that other play testers that are maybe gamers, not designers get annoyed because I'm not playing the game right. But I'm doing that on purpose to prove what should be already known. So like, I, Go ahead. There, there can be an instance where you want playtesting feedback on a certain aspect. That's like, okay, I want your opinion on this scenario. We change the balance. Is this side too weak or too strong? And it's like, I want you to exercise that aspect or, you know, a certain part. And if you're running off trying to break something else, like you, you may already know that this subsystem is broken, but right now I'm asking you to focus here, then hopefully they'll focus where you ask them to. Oh, that, okay, but, that's, a, that's a little different scenario when somebody says, will you play test the, the balance between force A, force B? But even within that, I'm going to look for an edge case. And I'm going to say, oh, I... I can have an infinite number of goblins. Oh, I'm going to swarm you, or whatever the case may be. Right. So, so someone can still find an exploit. The problem is if the person says, "Oh, I find an exploit. I'm stopping." Well, you can do this and win, and so therefore it's not balanced because it's broken here. There's a lot of value they can still do by. Okay, I found that. Cool. Now, don't do that and see what else you can find out about the balance or or whatnot. So. Right. You know, if, if, if a play tester just is going to go at a certain point and stop, that can be a problem. So that, well, people get into play testing for different reasons. Sometimes they just want to peek in and see oh, what's going on. Right. Yeah. And so yeah. they'll do some little bit and put it and they'll be happy. I found one bug and I put it in my report. OK, yay. Maybe I'll get my name in the back of the book or something. <laughs> and then others want to, you know, really pound the shit out of it, pound the snot out of it. And they want to do as good a job as they can. They really like, mm -hmm. you know, you as a designer, or they like the idea of this game, or that's just what they do, what they get great personal satisfaction at trying to 
help break things to help make them better you know and right. those are just so invaluable if you if you get somebody who's like gerald um <laughs> um yeah, Gerald. Um, <laughs> he's working right now on Thunder in the East. He's uh, the whole Frank Chadwick's. Uh, oh, very cool. Uh, ETO system, and you know between the the Middle Sea and that. So he's been working on that for a while. So. Oh, nice. He he, he retired a few years ago. So he knows what he's doing. Is, what you're saying is, is playing. Well, he's, you know, I I, I I met him. He was in college and I was in high school. Yeah, there's a little story. I'm gonna tell it. I'm gonna. It's, it's gonna take a Go minute, ahead. but so. I was at Roosevelt High School in Seattle, and this dude comes in the chess room and looks around. and Are you Mike Anthony? Yeah. And he says, Oh, yeah. My sister saw uh, your thing in the school newspaper. They had to say, What do you do to get in the Christmas spirit? And I had said, Play war games. And his sister had said, Hey, Jay. You know, they called him Jay or Gerald. Um, you know, so she she showed it to him. And so he just came to the school. Like, Where would a, a war game dude be? Wow, the chess club, right? And so he came and found me. So that was my story meeting Gerald Johnson. So. That's kind of a cool story. Thanks to his sister. And yeah. now it's a lifelong friendship. Yep, 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 yep. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah, so she's still fired up, as you can tell. <laughs> rambunctious kitty. Yeah, well, she's six. She shouldn't be quite as uh, rambunctious, but she is. <laughs> she hears me talking, and like most cats, she's, she thinks it's to her. Right, right. So, yes, yeah. it must be the center of attention. So, but, but pulling this back into the the context of the solo, the solitaire. I'm gonna I'm gonna, I'm gonna start saying solitaire. Um, Just call it playing with yourself. <laughs> Try, you know, I, I I purposely did not put that into the title. Oh. <laughs> um. I think that's going to be the the challenge of. Okay, there are many challenges in designing a solo game, but I think that play testing is an extremely important piece of the process that shouldn't be overlooked or minimized. And in a solo game where you have hidden information or you're trying to test, say, a, a playbook or a rule book, to your point, that virgin play tester who doesn't know what's going on is extremely valuable because you're going to get that raw experience of somebody sitting down to play the game. Um, but to and your point, in the solo design world, to find those people, because you just need one at a time. Whereas if you have a multiplayer game that requires six players, and you want to test it with six fresh virgin players, and you need to do that multiple iterations, wow, that is tough. So building multiplayer yeah. games that require a lot of players is a huge challenge to get fresh players all the time. So solo's good. <laughs> that, that's a good point. Um, and I think we've done a, an episode on playtesting. If not, we'll do another one uh, because I think this is there's so much to, to still talk about. But one of the things that I did, which won't work, I think, for the wargaming, is in San Diego there were pre-COVID, and they're starting to come back now, meetup groups that get together on Tuesday night, and there's one on Thursday night. I think at one point I could, I could find a gaming group that was pretty open to the public on – pretty much any night of the week. Uh, now, the challenge was you'd go to a local bar and you had to play in sub-optimal lighting more often than not. Uh, but what you'd get are people that would show up with their Kickstarter games that wanted to play the games that they bought. And there would be 20 or 30 people. And I would show up and play those games. And I would also have a game that I was working on. And you'd be surprised the number of people that would be like, hey, I'll play test. And some of them would, would I'd show up and they would say, hey, you brought that game last time. I'd like to play that one again. Or you get anything else you want play tested. And then there'd be other people who would play test the game and they'd be polite. And at the end, they would realize that's not what they wanted to do. They wanted to, to drink and or whatever and hang out with their friends and play the latest Kickstarter game, but they thought it was interesting to your point and they do it. And then eh, 
that's a little raw for me because it's not, I don't feel like I'm actually playing a game. I feel like I'm play testing, <laughs> which, you know, if you've never done it, you don't know what it's like. And a good play test session is like a good game in a lot of ways, but sometimes the game is early in the design. Um, and my point is, I don't know if I'm going to have that luxury with war games, where with board games, because of where I'm at and because of the the way the the society society is the wrong word the culture was around board gaming at least in san diego i didn't have any problem um, finding new people to play test games uh, and then there's a couple of really small conventions where you know we'd set up a table and people would come by and uh, there's actually a san diego game design group that that gets together and i've missed the last two just because i'm i'm not on facebook enough to keep up with them but so that's, I think, a challenge as a solo or a solitaire game designer is getting that fog of war play tested because as designers, we're going to know it. And I, I think that's that's one of the things that I it's a love-hate relationship for me anyway, because if I design a solo game and I know, say, what the, the playbook is, the challenge is how can I make it so that it surprises me or keeps me on my toes as the designer outside of the play testing? Because if I can do that, then I think that that may answer the question of the virgin play tester, because if it has the replayability, then a play tester who's played it three or four times is still on edge. They still don't know what the game is going to do or how the the play is going to, to play out, how the game's going to play out. And, that, and now as I say that, it, there becomes this realization as I'm mouthing it that that's kind of the key here. So some aspect in the game that, that people enjoy is discovery. You know, figuring out, oh, this is in this game, this, this event, this thing, this is cool. And it's like, as the designer, you already know that it's there, right? You, 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 you don't get those kind of surprises at all. Now, you can get surprised by the interaction of subsystems. And it's like, well, this thing's happening. This thing is, oh, my God, I never knew that, you know, this could happen at the same time. And wow, you know, you can get surprised. And that can be fun. And it's either a good surprise or a bad surprise. Like, oh, <laughs> you know, that was a well, combo party kill or something. Or, you know, not, not expecting a certain, you know, perfect storm to hit. And, you know, maybe that's good. Maybe that's bad. Um so, so sometimes the, the, the knowledge that someone has, the hidden information, I mean, it can be as simple as here's a deck of cards and you may have some idea of what cards are coming. Now, at a certain level, you don't even know what the cards are at all, right? right. You're, so, you're so learning new, fresh that you, know, you have no clue. But then there's the part where it's like, well, I got an idea what's there, but I don't know when it's coming, when certain things are happening. Right. And then sometimes you can add elements to your game that helps you like, you know, peek at the next X number of cards or, you know, you know, you know, not search the whole library, but search, you know, the X number of cards, maybe put one in the top or something, or, or maybe put one on the bottom or something like I want to avoid something or right. you know, whatnot, rearrange the next five cards or, you know, so there's a well, way you that you mythic can... last weekend. And so to some degree right. that you experienced that, right? Yes. You didn't know yeah, what was yeah. in those decks. The, the, I can't remember the name of that uh, minion that, uh, the recon was it recon? Mm -hmm. Where you look at the five, yeah, yeah. So it's like okay, so that aspect, you know, something that that can be thematically in your game, which, which you know, always helps enjoyment when the 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 theme and the mechanics mesh. Yes, and and you're giving someone a chance to say like it's not all just random. There's certain things I can do to try to gain information that can help me play smarter, make better decisions, et cetera. So that's always nice to have something like that instead of things well, always just agency totally and, hitting you by surprise at random, you know? Yeah, and I agree. And and, and I'm not going to get into the discussion on Mythic too much other than um, having mitigation as one of those lovers that I talked about, I think is important. Um, there's the, oh, my God, something bad really just happened. And then you go, oh, but I can mitigate it. That gives you a sense of agency as a player, right? Um, 
and to your point, yeah, you. I, I think there's both the unknown what when you first start playing a game, what's in the deck or what what things are going to happen. But then there's also the I know what's going to happen, and oh my god, how can I avoid it? When you play a game enough, and I think if you can design a game that ultimately gets to that point, because you're going to by default, I think, have that. First time you play a game, you, like with Tarawa, I don't know what some of the event cards were. So as I'm playing, it's like, oh, my God, that could happen. Or I didn't realize I, I took a risk, and then that card came up. And had I known that was in there, and after you play it a bit and you start to get a sense of how frequently it comes up, then you can go, oh, that's about a 40% chance that that bad thing's going to happen. Maybe I don't want to push those Marines that far. Um, but that just comes from playing the game, to your point. Right. And so even knowing can have a, a metagaming effect. And I think a good game, a good design, especially a solitaire design, even when the fog of war dissipates to some degree, you, maybe you replace it with the fear of war. <laughs> Lack of a better term. So Grognard Rich says the challenge is best when you can outsmart the AI and not outluck the dice. I can't agree more with that statement. Um, there's people talk about games being easy or difficult when the, I think the appropriate term is not easy or difficult. It's lucky or unlucky. And um, they make a game harder by making something less probable. And to me, to Grognar Rich's point, it just becomes a game of luck. And at that point, I start to lose. I'll play it sometimes out of the curiosity of how lucky can I get. I mean, sometimes I'm in that mode. Um, other times it's... I, I, I want I, I don't want it just to be about the roll of the dice. I want to have some agency. I don't want it to be like, oh, one in six chance you survive this every single time. And I've got to make eight dice rolls where I survive or, oh, I lost the game. Um, yeah. <laughs> hey, Eric, what does he say? Oh, hold on. It says, I'm late for the party tonight. <laughs> no worry, my friends. No worry. Uh, until Mike is says not late. Just turn up the music. There we go. <laughs> um, but yeah, so Grognard dead. I, I like I said, I agree a hundred percent with that. Every, again, every now and then, uh, and I don't mind randomness. I don't mind luck to some in a game to some degree because I think that is part of life, right? And so you can put that into a game. But when you have a game that that is the main determining factor on the gameplay, and if it's overused, it's like salt, right? A little bit is nice. Too much, ugh, you can't digest it. <laughs> well, or like your hot sauces, Mike. There's a level where you go, this is enjoyable. I like this. And then there's a point where it's just, I'm going to just survive this. <laughs> I'm, I'm definitely about flavor, not about heat. So my consumption of hot sauce is in the search of flavor, not ever increasing levels of heat. So there have been some bottles that I've thrown out. It's like, nah, this is not doing anything other than trying to overwhelm you with heat. It's gone. Right. And, and for so those of you who don't know. can be like that. And I didn't say this earlier, and, and shame on me. Meandering Mike has a YouTube channel. I will put a link in the description. And um, he has a propensity to be like midnight, and he drops videos. I'm like, <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, about you know two thirds of my videos, I start saying, you know, howdy, folks. Meandering Mike, man, came at us just before midnight or just after midnight because that's what yeah. I'm filming most of the time. Yeah, no, I, I, I think it's funny because there are times where I'm up and I'm like, oh, fresh content. Let me check this out. 
Um, but my point was that he does, and I, I saw one, I don't know if this, I, but I got the sense that it's kind of a regular feature. You kind of review and talk about hot sauce. Well, I was doing things on food storage and like, you know, prep, prep, prepper stuff, not, I always say I'm not a doomsday prepper. I was a Boy Scout style prepper. And so I started <laughs> covering different kinds of food to store, having a variety. So stocking in depth or breadth. And one of the videos was on chili and that sort of went semi-viral. And I had one on hot sauce, which didn't do that good. But I started getting into hot sauce more watching that show, the the hot ones about the hot wings, the dude that he interviews, you know, celebrities and, and, and eats hot wings. But, mm -hmm. and so... I've done two of them so far. I'm, I'm probably about ready to, to maybe do a third sometime in the next month if I stock up some more. But yeah, that was just a, a weird thing that I didn't plan to get into hot sauce land. But Well, I, 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 tell you, I caught one of them and I enjoyed it. So that's the reference that I'm making about the hot sauces because Mike has become my de facto expert on hot sauces now. I turned to, and I told you you should change the name of your channel from the Man Cave to the Midnight Madness Man Cave, something along those lines. After Hours with um, Midnight yes. Mike. After Dark. <laughs> so, Gragnar Rich, very good point again, my friend. Um, Avalon Hills uh, B17, Queen of the Skies, is about dice rolls. Gave me a great education about what happens on the missions, but there was no decision making. Uh, I've done target for today. I don't own target for tonight. And I got a sense that it's very similar. The, there's a lot of dice rolling and I, I don't mind dice rolling. I'm one of those people that, that don't, I don't mind going from one column to another column to another table to roll the dice and figure out what's, what's going on. Um, I'm okay with that. But I think your point about decision making now, and I, and I will say this maybe in defense of that game, what the crew of that B-17 really didn't have a choice of where it was flying to and where it needed to get home. And other than flying over and dropping your bombs, I don't think there was much decisions to be made uh, other than shooting at the bad guys who came near you. So in defense of, and maybe to your point, as a gaming experience, I think that's valid, but I think historically it's fairly, I, I hate to say accurate when we're talking about games, but in the context of a game, I think it does, to your point, we're talking about the education, I think there's a pretty good job of that. And maybe it's not something, like for me, I sat down and I tried to play a full campaign and that was just too much for me. It wasn't engaging enough for me to do that. And I know there are people who love that stuff. And again, I had good experience with it. I'll play it again. I'll have a good experience with it. Um, but I don't see myself grinding out 25 missions in a month. Um, I need a little more variety because my brain, I'm, I'm hopping all over the place with game designs and ideas and what's the hottest and shiny object. I'm really bad at shiny object. Um, but yeah, and what's he say? I agree with historical randomness and indeed referring to, yeah. And again, I think for what that game is uh, as a solitaire game, I think it works. It'd be interesting to play that as a co-op, but again, there's not a lot of player agency. So I don't know, that would just be a bunch of people sitting around playing a solo game in close proximity. It would be interesting if, if if we're playing and I get shot down, what Mike's reaction would be. Woohoo! I'm the I'm the leader now. <laughs> maybe, it's, maybe not. It's a problem if it's sort of mm, it's a narrative story driven game, which yeah, it has all these random events and things that happen from here to here. But like the only if the only decisions you really make are at the end, after we got back, we see who survived, like how do you spend your experience points or something? You know, do you you promote this person or give them this training? And like I said, in a multi-team game or cooperative game, like that's even more boring. We all sat around, we all wait, decided, you know, now we split up the experience points and they have to spend them on ourselves or something like that. That would be, you know, like as a as a crew commander, you could decide, oh, who who you're gonna, you know, give the perks to or whatever. I'm not familiar with that particular game. I haven't played it, but yeah. you know, I've played other games where you 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 level up your crew, but at least in something like ambush, hex by hex as you moved, you were making a decision which hex to enter next. 
you know, and which weapons you have. I need out. to buy that again. I used to own it. And one, I want it as a, as a, as a tool in my toolbox to, to, to design around. Um, but also it's so unique. Um, and it brings back childhood memories, you know, and I'm sorry, there's games that just do that. And I, I own them for that very reason because I'm oh, a yeah. nerd. nostalgia. Um, yeah. But, it, but what else could you do? I mean, not to do a deep dive on, on, on this game, but you have the, the Hunter series, right? That people love. And I don't see a ton of agency in that game series either. Am well, I right? I mean, it's like you have to roll on a mission table. So it's not like you're out just going, I'm going to go over here or I'm going to go over there and come what may. It's you roll on a table. Oh, nothing happened. Nothing happened. Something happens. And then you choose whether you're going to go on the server. And I, again, I haven't played it. I've watched, um, I've watched Zilla play it. And he does a great job of tying the narrative in. Um, but I don't remember there being much agency in that. And I don't want to say that just because you don't have agency, it's not a good game. Again, a lot of people like the narrative. And when I go watch a movie, I have almost no, um, other than me getting up and leaving, I have no agency. So it's not like that's a requirement in a solitaire game. But if you've played my Richtofen game, you have a lot of agency in that game. Yes, it's an air combat game, but you are really engaged in the actual dogfight, right? And whether I do combo, do I do I shoot now? I can hold off, and if I can match again, I, I, I built quite a lot of player agency, and it's not just rolling on a table, which could easily have been done. And, and But that wasn't how I wanted to design that game. So I feel like in that particular design, I've done a, a knock-up job of, of giving you player agency and you can also have the narrative and everything else and do the campaigns and, and and things like that so you know as as was mentioned earlier uh i think it was stuka joe's about in terms of movement and and whoever moves the farthest was that stuka who said that and, and it's the less you move the less it's it's harder for the ai to do it's the same with just decision points for players something that's highly on the defensive. You know, you've got a bomber formation, it's going on a mission, it's heading to place, you're trying to stay in formation, you want to bomb, and you don't deviate from that. Where are the interesting decision points? Whereas if you're like, ah, oh, we're going to intercept this bomber formation, you know, and how do we want it to go about this? Where do we want to try to, to crack these dudes? Can we peel yeah. some off out of the formation or whatnot? You know, so on attack, on maneuver, that's always... 99% of the time going to be more interesting than static defense or keep the formation or stay the course, you know, bleh. mobile defense. That's another story. That's maneuver, right? So, well, I yeah. think Krognard Rich brings up a pretty good point here. So, so there's probably more agency in deciding operational targets and getting punished for choosing wrong and rewarding. So if you were to take the, the target for today, target for tonight, and in a campaign series as opposed to just surviving. And again, I don't want to diminish it because it's a very popular series and I had a lot of fun playing it and I will play it again and I will have fun. But in the context of this conversation about player agency, I think that would be a very nice addition to that system. Um, is well, to so design. Go ahead. Who, who are you playing? Are you the, you know, the bomber commander of the the wing or are you the 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 main commander of the formation that's being launched on a mission or you play one as of them's interesting one of them's not right so like you said in an operational choice of targets you don't get to decide that as you know the 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 formation leader you you know is it's, i don't know the exact right terms but whoever the the bomber commander is of the the wing or the squadron or whatever that's the choices I'm sorry, Skelly Gremlin. <laughs> when the game is nothing but rolling on tables, the folks that engage in that aren't gamers. They're actuaries and accountants pretending to have an imagination. Dude, that's brutal. That's brutal. Sometimes uh, the truth hurts. 
<laughs> Maybe. <laughs> well, no, again, uh, I, I'm going to go back to what Grognard Rich said here. And by the way, Hexie, I see you, my friend. Thanks for stopping by, you and um, Warm Up. I think I saw Warm Up pop his, 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 his little head up and say hi. Thanks, guys, for, for dropping in. Um, so, so Grognard Rich says there's probably more agency in deciding operational targets. So if you're playing that, so to answer your question, Mike, in, in those games, you play as the crew of a B-17. And if you take, say you lose your tail gunner, you get another tail gunner. And, and theoretically, you could lose all starting 10 crew members and finish that campaign in that aircraft and maybe even a different aircraft. Um Although I think if you lose all your crew, you know, that's, that's obviously in, in one mission. Um, but I think over time, you could probably play a 25 game campaign and lose a number of your crew members and you just replace them. So that's what you play as. And so in that context, you're not making these operational decisions. But your I. Your decisions sound like it's like, well, do we break formation and run? Do we early jettison our, our bomb load or payload? To, to run <laughs> and that's about the only decision do you keep pressing forward and maybe get shot i don't even know if that's an option <laughs> i i think it's more of a it's a and again I'm, i want to be careful of the words that i use but it's a game on a rail and you roll for encounters and those encounters come up and you roll on a table to see whether you hit or you shoot them down or they do damage to you uh, i and I don't think there's much player agency as in, I mean, I guess you could choose, oh, we're not going to shoot that at that Fock Wolf. Uh, why would you not? Um, and again, I think based on the context of that game, who you play, but what's to say you can't have a game where you take multiple roles, where you are the operational. Um, and I don't know what that, who makes those decisions on the targets. Obviously that's on a very high level. On, on what, when those are chosen, as opposed to flying, being in the, the crew. But I don't think that there's anything that says you can't play multiple roles. So in one sense, you're playing as that operational decision maker and one aspect of the game. But then when it gets into the actual mission, you zoom down into that crew level and you play as the crew. So you're playing the crew for the mission um, that you as the operational decision maker chose that target. Um, I believe in Stutka, not Stutka Joe, but in the, the game coming up, I watched uh, Zilla play and you have choices for your loadout. And I think with A4, and I want to get that game because my dad was in a squadron that had A4. So there's a, there's a little bit of love there um, for me. Hey, somebody found us. <laughs> Hi, Eric. Um, but in those games, you have a choice of loadout. I don't know if you have a choice of your missions. You might. I haven't played them enough. But the fact that you can choose what you're going to arm your aircraft with will definitely have an effect on your mission. And I think that's going to give you some agency. right? And for me, the narrative is good. Again, getting back to the, the solitaire aspect and luck, I think that something like um, Queen of the Skies is, and it's been so long since I played it, I don't want to say that it's all luck dependent, but it, it seems like uh, it could very well be. When I did um, Target for today, now I, I got to be honest, I did it while sitting inside a B-17 and I was still 12 years old mentally like oh my god i can't believe they let me just sit in this airplane and walk around uh, and, and just be here before they opened up the air museum and then i was rushed to get a game in and so i hand waved parts of it to try to get everything done because again i i get there and <laughs> i didn't just focus on knocking out a video right i got there and i was Again, at 12 year old. So, hey, Warmut, again. 
I, I can't say I disagree. I'm assuming you're talking about uh, the accountants there. Uh, about already. Oh, Eric, can you hear us, my friend? I don't know if you can hear us or not. Maybe we can. Um, Charles, I would. I don't think that needs to be the case. I was going to say I disagree with you, but I, it's not that I disagree. Um, hold on one second. Yeah, Eric is thumping the button. Was it a what's this button do moment, Hiss? I don't know what button we're talking about, boss, but I have those moments all the time. So Charles is talking about, I believe in hunters that at some point you can pick your operational area. Um, yeah, but uh, <laughs> yeah, now I, I will say this, they had the cockpit roped off and they just said, just don't go up there and touch anything. And part of me wanted to sit in the, the pilot seat and as you say, I wanted to push buttons and vroom, vroom, and pretend I was flying that bad boy. Um, but that was such a cool experience. Um, and it's interesting for me uh, on that particular, that experience was, I never realized, you, you see these in the movies, and, and you think these are really big aircraft. Um, and it really isn't, relatively speaking. Uh, and, and the fact that there were 10 people in that aircraft flying at that altitude uh, on a combat mission um, was very eye-opening for me. And if anybody, if you ever get a chance to go to the Air Museum, I don't know what he's doing. I'm going to. Eric, can you hear us? I'm going to mute him until he says something because we're just hearing noise. So I muted you, boss, just to, to keep the background noise down. Um, yeah. But yeah, so Hex, that was a, that was a, such a cool experience. And at some point, I'd like to go back. But I, I would highly recommend, much like going to the, the Gettys Field, or Gettys Field, the Gettysburg Battlefield, yeah. uh, those types of experiences, to, to go to an air museum that has some of these older aircraft, especially if you can uh, get inside of them. It really puts a perspective on what these people went through. Uh, and I, at some point, I want to go to one of these tank museums and get inside of a tank. I'm, I'm a bit claustrophobic. Um, so that I don't think I would have been a submariner in real life. Um, and a tanker, you can get out, but um, I'm not sure how well I would have done with that as, as well. So Grogner Rich says, I was a, in, a, in a B-24 Liberator a few months ago. Yeah, it, it's a cool experience. Uh, and like I said, I just reached out to the Air Museum. I said, hey, I'm a nobody. I've got a YouTube channel. I play games. I'd like yeah. to come and sit inside your B-17 and play a B-17 game. And they're like, hey, that's cool. Sure. <laughs> All I had to do was pay the four bucks to get in. And they let me have access to the aircraft. So just don't touch the controls. Don't go in the cockpit and uh, everything else. We've got a docent. You get any questions, they'll answer it. And the docent just kind of watch what I was doing not as a, a, a bird dog, but just out of curiosity. Yeah. Uh, and it was a fun afternoon. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, there we go. Hi, Eric. Welcome. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, Hex, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was a nice experience. So back to what um, Charles was saying and, and kind of on the topic of solo, where he says solo equals nil agency or solitaire equals nil agency. I don't think it has to be like that. I think you can design a good solitaire game. And I'm going to argue that with Richthofen, you have player agency. In fact, Eric, you play tested it. Do you think yeah. that there's a decent amount of player agency in Richthofen? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you have to react to everything that happens or else you shut down or, you know, you, you have to make the right moves. Um, you know, uh, I think it was game three. I was able to connect a super combo that scored, what, 13 hit points on Chris? And yeah. Shut him down. You know? Yeah. So, yeah, there's a lot of tension within the game. Um, and I do, I, I, 
I do enjoy solitaire games that have that, you know, that it's not just the bot telling you what to do, but, you know, you're trying to outsmart the bot. Um, I don't know. I think that's important. You know, a solitaire game can be too easy or else it just becomes dull and stupid. You know, why waste the time? Um, there are a lot of a lot of good games out there for sure. And I, I don't know, I, I, I think in wargaming, there's a tendency that more games are very difficult than too easy, the way I see it. In board games, sometimes, uh, maybe not as much. Yeah. You know? Um, just because of the scenarios, I think, with the war games that, you know, can make it... Some of them can be almost impossible to even beat it. I don't like it like that too much. I like it hard, but not impossible. You know, the, you always need that kind of, uh, you need a way to win. <laughs> you know, you don't want to be destroyed by the AI the whole time. Yeah, you know, it's, yeah um, I don't know if you heard my comment earlier. I was talking about the difference between uh -huh. um, something that's easy or difficult as opposed to lucky or unlucky. Um, yeah. Where... Yep. Sometimes people say, oh, that game was really hard, when what they're saying is that it's statistically because of the dice rolls, um, wow. you have to be luckier to get through something. And, and if there's not a lot of agency where you can modify your dice rolls somehow, uh, then it does become a game of just straight luck. And again, occasionally I'll play those because I just want to see if I if I can get through it and, and I'm curious about, again, the design, because a lot of times I'll play games and I look at it strictly from a design point of view and try to understand what the designer was thinking. What was the experience they're trying to get across? Um, why yeah. did they use that mechanic? Oh, that's, a, that's an interesting use of that mechanic. I want to explore that. I want to play that and see how, if I can incorporate that into one of my designs or, wow, I think that they have something here that maybe isn't fleshed out that maybe I could flesh it out, right? Yeah. And again, that's not to say somebody's ideas are good or bad or, or whatever. It's It inspires yeah. you creatively to look at a design and plug it into your game or, again, yeah. tweak it to make it work for your game. And Mike had said something earlier, which I think is really important, mm -hmm. um, is the marriage of your theme with your mechanics. Yes. And I think that that's more relevant in a narrative style solitaire game mm -hmm. than what you're going to get, say, on an operational level, two-player giant X encounter game. And I mean it in this sense. Um, now, I've got OCS. I've got, an, I've got DAC2. It's a game I bought years ago. It survived the divorce. And at some point, I'll, I've got to figure out how to get it on the table without the cats. That's going okay. to be my challenge. But, and I haven't played OCS, but of what I understand, it's very much a game of supply. Oh, okay. Okay. And so there's an example of where the mechanic and the theme uh -huh. at that level seem to go hand in hand, right? You're trying to yeah. control these yeah. forces. You've got combat resolution, but you have to make sure that they're, they're supplied to be able to do that. Right. And, that's critical in those that's in warfare in general, but clearly yeah. in, in, in a, a operational game on that scale. Mm -hmm. Now, somebody like Hex to Hex could talk more to big games because uh, I don't play a lot of them again because yeah. of the the handicap of my cats, as you saw earlier. She yeah yeah just go crazy, but um, so. Bringing it back to the, this agency, I think, and we talked earlier, Eric, about um, designing a solo game and how yes. you can build Fog of War into it. And yeah. um, Mike kind of seeded my brain with the concept of a playbook. I was calling them scripts, but I okay. like the idea of a playbook better and having multiple points of diversion off of that playbook. Um, oh, okay. And to your, to your point, Mike, that's what a good quarterback does is they call an audible. They'll call a play in the, in, the, in the huddle, and then they get to the line, and then they'll audible it to something else. And then the receivers are taught when you're running a, a pattern 
Um, yeah. If that inside linebacker is playing a zone and drops uh -huh. back into your zone, cut your pattern from a fly to a post or whatever, right? Right. So right. you had a lot of not to get into too much in the football dynamics, but you have uh -huh. these decisions that are made. And I yep. think when I get into because one of my challenges that I want to do is I want to take VUCA games as uh, the hunt for Bismarck or the chase of the Bismarck. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That one looks good. Yeah, but it's a very much a two-player game with a lot of um, uh -huh. hidden information. And, you know, people oh, say, okay. oh, if it's a game with hidden information, you can't play it solitaire. Okay. Um, let me rephrase that. You can't play it solo, You meaning you can't play both sides. And I yeah, think yeah, that, yeah, right. I think that's true. Uh -huh. And what I was telling Mike, one of the, the the way I look at it is I have a yep. box with components in it uh -huh. and some rules. Yep. Can I just rewrite the rules? How about you make your own solo bot for the game? I'm sorry? How about you make your own solo version of the game? Well, that's what I'm yeah. saying. Yeah. Is take I the game, you. take those the, the components in that box and create a playbook where the yeah. Bismarck is going to go north and then it's going to go south or then it's going to go right up the middle or whatever. And you mm -hmm. can come up with um, some viable. I, I don't want to call it a bot, but I don't have a better term other than it's a playbook for the the yeah. the bot to use. Yeah, that it's going to move a certain number of squares, and then it could. Now, the the trick will be how do you manage that, um, right? As a player, not knowing what that playbook is doing for eight turns, and how do you check and get results back? Because yeah. there's an unlimited number. Okay, it's not unlimited, but for this conversation, there's an mm -hmm. unlimited number of things I might do, and do I put those into? a general classification to say, if I do a search in this area, uh -huh. um, go read this paragraph. And that may give me some insight as to what script that I'm playing against or playbook I'm playing against, what might that result be? Such as nothing found or something found to keep it simple. So remind me, Mike, is it, uh, what kind of, is it a roll and write game? That one? No, no, it's a two player. Uh -huh. um, game where you've got your board, I've got a board, we've got um, uh, um, the screens? Or... A screen, thank you. A screen oh, between us. Okay. Oh, okay. I, I got to check that one out. I might, oh, I might be, I might be getting that one confused with something else. Yeah, if, if that game, uh, th does that have a TTS? Uh, I, it does. And you know what? Maybe you and I could get together and play it sometime. Oh, let's do it. Yeah. 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 I'm pretty sure I know which game you're talking about. It's from oh, VUCA. Oh. And I guess, yeah. and, and, and not to open a can of worms, but, you know, people say, oh, this, this, this hobby's dying and people are going to gray and die and leave nothing behind. And then you have somebody like VUCA come along, and I think they're in their early 30s and they're putting out top quality, engaging okay. games. That, that games look beautiful, too. Oh, look my God. Game. Yeah. I haven't seen a bad one by them. And they're not the only one, by the way, yeah. but just to put yeah. up, put the rest that concept that this 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 hobby is is on its last legs when you see stuff like that, it just contradicts those statements in my opinion. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. off my soapbox. I think it's the renaissance right now for board games and war games. Right? Absolutely. Not only do we have all the old stuff, yeah. we got new stuff. Yeah. And how many yeah. different war game magazines are there where you can actually get a game in a magazine? Well, exactly. I, I have actually been trying to collect um, the uh, the old, uh, what is it called? Been getting from Noble Knights. Um, is it S&T war games? Uh, Strategy and Tactics? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I've, I've been trying to get, you know, um, older games. Just because, you know, I, I want to check them out and look at the maps and look at the, you know, what the counters mm -hmm. were at the time. Uh, I just, I got, I have a few of them. I, I, I really, I need time. <laughs> well, you I'm know like, what? I, I, my subscription to Against the Odds is done. I'm going to renew it. Um, yeah. I like to randomly get nice presents in the mail. 
And that's what a game <laughs> magazine yeah, subscription yeah. does. Oh, and gosh. sometimes you're going to get a topic that maybe you didn't think you'd like. And you look at the game and next thing you know, you're you're up till midnight researching about elephants in India. I the same thing. Right? I, yeah, you learn something you didn't know before. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let me go back. So Grognard Rich says, my wargaming purpose is to learn about the historical military situation. The mechanics are important insofar as they demonstrate the full aspect of the issues bearing upon the situations. So I'm going to paraphrase. That's a means to the end. <laughs> oh, here we go. What do you got there? I can't see. He's got elephants. Uh, nice. Macedonian elephants stolen from India. Yep. Hey, Mike, I got a question for you. Did you reach your 500 goal? I blew past it. Uh, as I've last nice. checked, it was at 510. Nice. nice. Congrats, yeah, 510. I got a lot of help. A shout out from Mo from uh, the Whiskey Charlie Group at Mo's Game Table. Nice. And then Not Jay did a great job uh, pushing a few people in the chat. Yeah. Uh, last night to join up, and then I was like one yeah. away, and I posted on my Facebook, um, and I decided not to put the link directly in the Facebook post because I I found out that they really uh -huh. shy about outside links, and I only put the links in the oh, comments. And I just said, "Hey, I'm you know at 500, trying to reach exceed 500," and I got. Yeah. A whole bunch of responses from that. So, awesome. if you're promoting your channel on Facebook, don't direct link. Put it in the comments. Okay, good to know. There you go. Good to know. Yeah. And congratulations on that, dude. That that's a nice accomplishment. So yeah. I'm, I'm I'm filming tonight the the giveaway. I'll I'll do a premiere of it tomorrow. I I made all the little by hand the the, the drawing tickets. I've got. Nice. Uh, four diff five different containers to do the five drawings. So I'm I'm almost awesome. ready to do that. Yeah, I'm I'm not, I, I don't want to take I don't want to take any of your prizes. So, but uh, oh, I, I do support what you're doing. Well, yeah, yeah. Eric signed up. Good man, good man, Eric. Yeah. Okay. Hey, my so, pick is a, a Viking sci-fi. Remember me. Remember me. <laughs> you're in there, man. You're in there. So uh, let me kind of catch up with some of these these comments here. I, I wanted to finish my thought on what um, Grognar was saying is, and I get that. And I think that's a very valid point th that you're coming into um, a war game from a learning aspect. And it's a different approach than what you see board hobby board gamers. A lot of times they'll be like, I like worker placement games and they'll try to find worker placement games because they enjoy the gaming experience that worker placement provides them. Mm -hmm. um, and what Rich is talking about is the mechanics need to illustrate the situation. Um, so if you have something that's a, a, a bit too abstract that takes you out of that yeah. experience, that's yep. probably not a good mechanic in learning the, the history of it. And maybe True. to kind of, bring this back around to the Avalon Hill Queen of the Skies, those mechanics, as you said, gave you a sense of what it was like for those pilots, although there wasn't much agency. And based on your comment here, it looks like it succeeded in giving you that military simulation, but the mechanics would have been nice had it given you as a player a little more agency. And I don't want to put words in your mouth, my friend. So if I'm wrong, just smack me up. Um, <laughs> what do we got here? Walk about nice. games says I've gotten some great ideas for my rules for solo and versus play for things like how environment, sound, and visuals affect the game. Cool. That's kind of uh, what our goal and our purpose of talking about this stuff is: is to share ideas, inspire each other. Uh, and maybe make a breakthrough on a game design we're working on. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, I don't know what's going on with Nightbot. I don't even know how that got activated. So sorry about that, Hex. <laughs> it says something about you spamming symbols. Um, ah, I got scratched. Nightbot is on the news. Nightbot did the same thing to Warmut, too. One of his posts disappeared. And it's just like if you repeat 
you know, exclamation points or question marks, like more than like three or four each, then it thinks you're spamming. And that's okay. So I'll have to figure out how to get rid of Nightbot because I don't think I enabled that. And I don't know or, if that's a default setting. Or uh -huh. configure it so it's not so anal about well, spam. Well, again, when I, when I started this, I didn't go through and configure it. I don't know how that's on the, the account. But anyway, that's <laughs> sorry for its rudeness, Hexi and Wormut. So Charles says, yep, the old SPI, s &T games are great. If you feel you need to hurt around your purchase out for free shipping, okay. Oh, boy. Oh, no, yeah. I, don't, I, I don't go that high, Charles. I can't. I'm poor, man. Yeah, <laughs> no, I'm in the same boat. Why do you think I did the postcard from the front so I can get free games? <laughs> there you go. Yep. <laughs> Usually what I do, I order like a couple of them. Uh, and it, it is SPI, Charles, by the way. Not, I thought it was, uh, strat uh, what did you say, Mike, before? Strategy and tactics? s &T, yeah. strategy and tactics. Yeah, no. SPI, the one they had SPI. Was, the one. SPI was the first publisher of strategy and tactics magazines. Yeah, yeah. those are the ones and I get. TSR yep. bought out TSI, and so TSR was publishing s &T, yep. And then TSR sold it to 3W, so 3W was ah. publishing s &T, and then they sold it to Decision Games, and Decision yep. Games is still publishing Strategy and Tactics magazine. <laughs> Dude, I got, I got a great game from one of those magazines, uh, from the SPI magazine called Wolfpack. It's a solo <laughs> game, by the way. Probably some of you guys might know that one. It's, um, it's just a battle of Atlantic, you know, strategy, um, you know, your bowl game. It's a it's a lot of fun. I probably one of the first solo games from what I've read. Um, it just uh, it was cheap too. One of the first solo games. Yeah. Wolf first, back, SPI. The first solo game in S and was Fall of Rome, I believe. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Wolfpack was um, in that series, Mike. Um, it was Fall of Rome, Wolfpack, and one more. I forget the name. Okay. Um, Operation Olympic was also a solo game. Yeah, that one's very nice. Um, if you guys are into um, your boat, so Mike Hexy doesn't he doesn't get a preview? No, the clue? preview video will announce it. I'll, 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 you know, film the video tonight. I'll release it as a preview tomorrow so people can watch together online to see if they win. And I'll be there in the chat to to respond, but it won't be, it won't be a live stream. Uh. Look at that cat. Someone's lazy. No. He's, he's ready for some cat. milk, Mike. Give him some milk, man. No, it's a she. Oh, it's a and, she. Yeah. Ah. And she just wants to be near me. So, you know. There you go. <laughs> I'll take Very it. Very comfortable. I'll take sure, whatever guys. wins I can get. There you go. So, I, I, for those who don't know, that the, that few minutes that Mike was talking, it was our impersonation of Art Wolf's channel. <laughs> Because uh -huh. that man knows everything about everybody and every little thing that was connected to whatever in history. I'm amazed with uh -huh. the sheer knowledge he has of the industry. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. I, I, I don't. So that's why I don't get into that kind of stuff. But I, I apparently Mike does as well. Yeah. Well, I own too many games. So that's why I know a fair bit about some of them. Fair enough. I, I, I wasn't going to bust your balls. I don't own all the games yet. No? Not yet. Well, I, you know, from tonight, I think uh, I, I've got to get that, um, oh, my God, Ambush. I've got to put that back on my list. I at least got to get a copy of it, so at least I have something that I can use as a, to design my own version of a an Ambush. Uh, so, why, why hasn't anybody done another Ambush okay. game? Let me, let me talk about that. Ambush is really cool. It's really fun. However, as reported by John Butterfield, it is a pain in the ass to develop, to actually make those error-free, you know, those multi-stage cards inside the sleeve, you know, like a, a crypto decoding thing. Yeah. That is a tremendous amount of work. If you were just programming the game, it'd be an order of magnitude easier. But to, to then, you know, if you program, and then you said, you had a formula for like, okay, now how do we turn this? It's like, like there's tools for creating crossword puzzles. It's like, you need that. You need to really, in a sense, program first, build your scenario computer game wise, 
and then turn it into this board game with the card sleeve thing because yeah. that's a lot of work. But well, maybe so, you want to make it work. I don't know. <laughs> that might well, be a challenge, right? Well, so here's 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 the way I look at this. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to get a copy of it at some point, um, which means in the next six months, just because I know they're not cheap. Um, Hey, later walkabout. Thanks again for popping in, my friend. And I'm glad you got some inspiration from tonight. And at some point, uh, I want to get you on to talk about your uh, tactical combat game. Um, the conversation we had on Not Jay's uh, just chilling, chilling chat um, was very enlightening and inspiring. And I'd like to have you on and talk about that. So we'll talk offline. Um, but thanks for popping in, my friend. See you, walkabout. So what was I? What was I saying? Ambush. You want ambush. ambush. So you talk about that sleeve with those decisions. I'm going to look at it and say, can that same goal be achieved through a different physical thing? Meaning not have to put it into that maybe, sleeve to maybe make that easier. I mean, it's a combination of booklet and the sleeve. You know, there's, there's hex numbers and things in a booklet and the sleeve, right. which, you know, it's just a transition of in the booklet, you do something here and you use this and then it gets you the next paragraph to go to. And so oh, cool. maybe, you know, but it's like Ace of Aces and the, the saloon gunfighting game all right. and all those uh, lost worlds, you know. I remember that with stuff. the picture books, right? You know, there it's like, depending on the game, it might fit one or the other model better or, you know, and you just, you know, like you said, choose your own adventure or fighting fantasy game book or whatever, mm -hmm. somewhere in between all that stuff. And yeah, there's probably out there some innovation that someone hasn't thought of yet that might be really slick and cool. and might be the way to bring that stuff into the board, you know, game tabletop arena. You know, well, if we take cool the ambush, and, and you know, you have a better understanding of the mechanic because it's been a long time since I played it, but I do remember the sleeve, and I do remember you you can move from hex to hex, which then that gets incorporated, which I think is just, again, and when I say why hasn't anybody done it, but clearly because it's a lot of work, right? Oh, even um, John Butterfield himself only did the, the original one. <laughs> you've got a, you go. a, a finite state machine where so the different as you go from card to card it's like it's it's escalating you know the 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 warning level or whatever but sometimes there's just special events where it skips cards but so it's yeah. a finite state machine and you're sort of keeping track within a location on a given map in a given state and if you make a mistake mm -hmm. you know as you move it can totally throw you off and if you mistake in building the thing where like, oops, you sent it to the wrong square or something, you know, those can be hard to, to track down. <laughs> and I would do that. Of where you're moving on the map, when, on which uh -huh. card, you know, it's complicated. I yeah. See. But see, that might also be something that could be useful in this playbook that we're talking about. Right? Yeah. Well, certainly defining something as a finite state machine where you've you've got decision trees and state changes and things like that you know you you really need to lay it out in a way that you can visualize it and see it you know um and, and whether that's through spreadsheets or cards or a computer program or you know stacks of index cards or playing cards that you, you put whatever well, that's why i put a link to twine because for that that yeah. I have found to be the most useful tool for that type of design. Now it's probably not perfect for everything, but when you're doing decision-based tree stories, that tool is perfect and built specifically to do that. So do you know, Mike, does the twine tool allow you to, I don't know what they call the diagrams. Like, is it a string board or something? You know, like I'm, I'm imagining like a, a cork board with pins and twine, right? And yeah, you're, you're drawing those things. Does it allow you to nest them? Like you define this set of twine pins and twine on a board, and then this one, this one, and then like okay, this could be inside this, and this because that's the huge tool. If you can, like I said before, like a bill of materials where this object. I don't see why you couldn't because you project. could set those as separate projects and then create a master of that. I, you could probably kludge it a bit to do that. 
to have it actually embed where it's where you drill in, drill out. Yeah, if it supports nesting, then it's like bingo, you got an awesome tool. I actually have it on my let me I'll call it up. We're at two hours and 15 minutes. So we'll go another 15 minutes tonight, guys, because I I think this is a really interesting conversation. But let me do a share here and I can show you what I've got for my Coast Watchers. OK, uh, where I'm at with that design and, and, and the, uh -huh. what I'm trying to accomplish with that. OK, so what I have here is let me go to that page. OK, so you have these. So chapter one, okay, you arrive. Now I can click into this and then this is where I can write some text and there are some formatting. This is all HTML stuff and uh -huh. on a roll of D10. So I, I'm just kind of working out some mechanics for some game stuff here as I'm playing along, right? Yeah. Uh, basically chapter one is you arrive. You're either gonna get a Tokyo Express shows up, Japanese destroyer, or you're gonna disembark. And then I've got disembark two and four only because I don't know what I'm going to call them yet. And if Tokyo Express shows up, even before you're you're because you're in a sub and you got to be dropped off on the island, you could get depth charged and game over. Okay, and if you survive that, I haven't figured out what's going to happen after that yet. Obviously, you don't see something going along. Uh, but then if you run into a Japanese destroyer, which might be tied into this one here. Um, Disembark two, it says after waiting almost two hours, the captain gives a call all clear and the subs crew prepare to surface to allow you to disembark. Okay. Uh, and then you're gonna decide whether you have some crude charts on where you're gonna get to shore or maybe you have no charts. And then based on that, you either get to the beach, you have to shoot the breakers or you have a strong current that maybe puts you on the island someplace other than where you expected to go. Um, you could then end up on the beach, get capsized, stuck on the reef, um, you can land on the beach safe alone. You might run into some natives. You might get spotted by or uh, an encounter with Japanese aircraft or a Japanese barge. Uh, and then there's, if the natives show up, they could be in a canoe. One of them could be an old friend that maybe is a contact with the local natives that you need to help set up your uh, watch post. So this is chapter one, which is getting just onto the island and getting your camp set up. And this is how I've got it branched out. Now, this will change as I go along. You see, I've got a lot of different arrows going through here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then I've got chapter two, settling in. Chapter three is the mission. This is probably going to go away. And then chapter four, you have to depart. And then I started doing some missions over here. Okay. Let me see. How do I scroll? Is this a card game, Mike? No, this is going to be a choose your own adventure book game. Oh, Okay. Okay. So supply drop would be a mission. So you roll maybe on a table and you get a supply drop and you have to do a test and you check your message, whether you got the message right or not. Um, random events, global or local, meaning there could be something that happens on a global level that might affect something locally. Um, supply drop two. So if I go to supply drop one, uh, I don't even have it say anything yet. Okay. Supply drop two. With limited visibility, the aircraft drop the supplies 15 miles away into a Japanese-held territory. You gather your party and start to make your way along a trail over ground jungle vegetation. And then based on your relationship with the natives, um, you're going to have your influence on you add fatigue. And if, again, I'm working on some mechanics here. So hopefully that kind of answers your question, Mike, to some degree um, on what this tool will allow you to do when it comes to making decisions. And I could envision this could be hex numbers. I move from this hex to this hex or that hex. Now, I don't want to build something that covers every possible hex movement and what's in the hex, which I think you probably could do if you're really crazy and a nutball. Uh, I'm, and I, I fluctuate between crazy and nutball and occasionally both of them same day, like most of us probably do. Um, but what this will allow you to do, I think to some degree might be that playbook, right? Mm -hmm. the, and again, have, oh, and it's free. It's you can free. Yeah. I like that. 
Um, yeah, I have to this. Looks like a good tool. Yeah, it's a, I found this a few years ago. It's actually pretty amazing, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. And again, it goes back to that influence of Tunnels and Trolls had on me when it comes to doing a choose your own adventure thing. I have to uh, ask you, Mike, since it look, you got a big stack of them. I don't remember the name of the adventure, but did you make love to the grandmother? <laughs> no. so that was a paragraph that had more than just like you fight the orc. That had some hefty description. I don't, that some of them do. I actually and have an autographed copy of this one. You earned a lot of charisma points for making love to the grandmother. It's a, actually a very good choice. <laughs> I, I vaguely remember that, so I may have. But I have this, which is kind of the City of Terrors, which was, you know. That might be the one. I can't remember. I'm trying to remember. Yeah, it's got some interesting art in it. Um, but it just, for me, oh, interesting. Tunnels and Trolls was a game. And again, I've got stacks of, of these. And if I ever go to a, a, a gaming convention and somebody's selling them, if they're reasonable, I snag them, even if I already got them. The only thing I didn't like about Tunnels and Trolls is the way they were designed. They had, like, you'd roll a certain amount of dice and you have a certain number of ads. And some of these adventures, the ads were, like, huge. And it's, like, the randomness, it's, like, you – it's, like, either it was too hard or too easy for you most yeah. of the time. It was hard to get an adventure that was, like, just right because of the way they designed it. So uh -huh. I, I, I didn't play it a lot. I mostly ended up just – reading some of them you know i did some playing and either died or <laughs> no what, what you're saying is accurate it. it's uh, very much a game of um extremes and what i mean by that is um you go into combat and very few of them to your point are going to be touch and go you're either going to obliterate them or you're going to get wiped out because of the dice roll or because of the ads and all of that um and you almost have to be the exact same level uh, for it to be much of a challenge. And again, I'm probably, uh, and I, I'm going to stop apologizing if I say something that offends anybody, but uh, it's, it's I, I played a lot. I loved it. Um, I didn't mind the, the, the imbalance of the combat because um, I just roll another character if I get killed. <laughs> and maybe that's why I like the hardcore stuff now in like Diablo is because um, tunnels and trolls sometimes would just punish you. You'd go up against the monster and go, yeah, I can't even damage it. And it's just going to stop me in two turns. And there's not much I can do, especially in a solo adventure where you don't have the option to just run. Right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and sometimes you want to spice things up a little, right? Just push your limit, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I did that on, on last Saturday morning and, and paid the price. <laughs> <laughs> so I heard from my digester. Yeah, yeah. He He's, popped he in right at the so end and that. watched me die. That was kind of <laughs> he was talking about he that. you, my friend. Uh, I, I, I made a poor choice. I know better. I know how these games basically work. And I was two yeah. hours in. It was close to level 10. And, I'm, and again, mm -hmm. to your point, Mike, it's a new version of the game. I don't know how hard they have these things set or what's good and bad or indifferent. And I thought I had the dungeon beat and I'm just running along thinking I'm going to the exit. And next thing you know, I hit the sub boss room, almost died. Yeah. And then I'm like, holy crap, I, I still got yeah. the boss and I barely got by this guy. This isn't, I should have just warped yes. out, but I was like, eh, what the heck? I'm going to, I'll probably survive. I'm yeah, going to try it out. <laughs> and then once I got locked in the room, I realized uh, I've did 20% damage and I've got no more health potions and I've got like eight hit points. I'm not coming back from this one. <laughs> yeah. But where's my body? Yeah. So anyway, guys, I'm going to go ahead and, and close this out. Uh, thank you so much, Mike, for spending some time with me tonight. Um, again, I, I struggle going solo. I, I still, as much as I talk, I still can't fill two hours yet. We'll get there. And it's good insight. I love the fact, you know, hearing more about your background on the computer side of things makes complete sense. And uh, I'm going to keep pushing you, dude, to um, to get a game into the card jam or the, the postcards. I want to see I am, what you can I am do. doing my research for the card game. Cool. Since I'm doing, you know, based on Greek mythology, whether it's Jason the Argonauts or Ulysses and the Odyssey or something else, uh, like the Labors of Hercules or something, somewhere in that space, I grab every single game that I have that has to do with Greek mythology, and I'm mining it for monsters and 
various, you know, the fates and this god and that god and demigods and all that stuff. So well, that's we got to get you talking with Richard because that's kind of uh, Ancients is right up his alley. Cool. Uh, Eric, thanks for showing up. I know you're late, but I appreciate you taking the time to pop in anyway, my friend. Yeah, for sure. Sorry about that today. I I didn't think I was going to make it at all tonight, but I said, oh, hey, glad I'm you here. Did. And then, um, <laughs> We'll talk about what we're going to do for the um, the play testers. If you got time after we're done here, stay on sure and do. we can come up with a plan for that. All right. As always, guys, I thank everybody that was in chat tonight. It was nice to see um, some some regulars and a couple of new people. So that's pretty awesome. Uh, if you ever want to get involved and be on here and talk about one of your games, or if you want to get one of your games play tested by us, we do a podcast called The Play Testers. And myself, Eric, and not Jay will take your game. We'll get it into Tabletop Simulator, preferably, or Vassal. And we'll play test your game. I know Mike had mentioned uh, Wolfpack. So, Eric, we're going to set something up with Mike uh, Budicelli to, to play test his um, soon-to-be-published uh, Wolfpack game which looks pretty fun. And he's, it's been played since quite a bit, but we'll get a chance to do that. He's made that offer and I'll follow up with him on that. Anyway, guys, as always, I appreciate you guys taking time to check out what we do. And until next time, I'll talk to you later.